the science of being transgender. How often is it the case that people go in depth about this topic regarding transgender using science? How many actually approach this question using science? Definitely not the right. I don't even see the left doing it. I don't even see the, the LGBTQ plus proponents utilizing a scientific approach. I think it would enhance both sides if they did. In this video, I want to get rid of some misconceptions. I want to talk more about the real hard science about the brain, the transgender brain, the cisgender brain, and, and perhaps help illuminate more about this uh, taboo topic here. The first misconception I want to get out of the way first is the idea that being trans means you want to change gender from a man to woman or woman to man. That's not what this means. Uh, all it means is that you were assigned a given gender at birth, you grow up and you don't align with that gender, right? It's really not about changing gender. It's just about finding out that you don't align with the gender that people assigned you. Remember, there is a distinction between sex and gender. Sex is chromosomal. It has to do with your chromosomes. XX, XY, there's also intersex. Gender has to do with your brain. It has to do with how you think. And people on the left say this all the time. Oh, gender is soci sociocultural. No, it's, it's not totally correct to say that. Uh, what's social is the idea that men are supposed to do this and women are supposed to have these roles and you know men are supposed to you know wear shorts and, and wear short hair and women are supposed to have long hair and wear dresses. That's social. Okay, that, that's socially constructed. But gender is rooted in the brain. Another misconception is that being trans is somehow a mental illness. It's not a mental illness. It was labeled that way decades ago, but it has since changed because it's not an illness. There's no ailments. There's no impairment of judgment or stability. There's nothing that would even represent harm. It's just a distress, as the DSM-5 recognizes it as a distress. No different than if any average person were to go through some life-changing or life-altering circumstance. It's just a distress. That's what gender dysphoria means. It means you're, you're, there's an incongruence between your assigned gender and the gender that you express. You don't want to express the gender that people tell you you want to. Just as if somebody told me that I was a woman and everybody in my family told me I was a woman and society told me I was a woman and when I, I don't feel like a woman, right? That, that's the kind of distress we're talking about. And people will say, well, uh, suicide rates are high amongst uh, trans folks. Well, yeah, of course. When the world around you tells you you're something you're not, when the world around you treats you in a discriminatory way, when the whole world around you treats you as if you're subhuman, uh, all the rhetoric from the right especially, that can do some damage. And just as suicide rates are high for trans folks, when they undergo that kind of discriminatory uh, experience, Undergoing an experience in which your family accepts you and you live in a culture that accepts you, studies show that trans folks' suicide rates go down. They plummet accordingly. So th there's no way in which this is tied to some kind of mental illness at all. Another fear is that people are becoming trans in higher quantities. That's not the case. Uh, there's no uh, external influences causing more and more people to become trans. Uh, it's just that more spotlight has been placed on this issue. We live in a, a culture that's becoming incrementally more accepting of this, especially in the LGBT community. People are finding it more accepting to come out, and so it, they are. And uh, we're seeing a respective confliction in, in ideas from other people. So we have this uh, toxicity buildup. That's all that's happening. Only point. 5% of the entire population of the world is trans. Okay, it's, it's not very common to be trans. Uh, however, that's still millions and millions of people around the world and millions of people in America who are trans. So we can't just throw them under the rug and say, oh, no, it doesn't matter. Or, we can't do that either. And I understand the gender critical sentiment in which people are saying, well, how can a man dress like that? They're a man. They look like a man to me. Well, yeah, you know, I understand. You've been, you've been taught all your life that a man's a man, a, a male is only male and female, and that's it. Men are supposed to do that. Women are supposed to do that. Bam, right? It's You've been trained in this binary thinking all your life. I understand that. <laughs> but what's happening is we're finding out more and more often, especially since the 90s, 
that this issue is becoming increasingly complicated and our understanding has to accordingly increase in complexity to match the complexity of this issue. But people on the left should also consider the fact that there's a psychological domain in which this issue requires attention. Um, people on the right who are gender critical aren't all evil people. They're not all bad people. They're just misinformed. They're just experiencing something called cognitive dissonance. They are in a moral panic because especially if you consider the, the most adamant among the, the gender critical are the ones who are typically religious. They're extremely religious because they, they want to uphold those traditionalist ideals. They want to be conservative. It's a very, very natural tendency for people on the right especially to maintain those those ideals so, so when they're confronted with this oh this new way this uh, complicated thing that all my life has been simple but all of a sudden it's complicated that doesn't make sense right plus all the other baggage it goes against my religious ideals it, it, it doesn't make sense to me I don't understand it so there's a fear that builds up you have to understand that the psychology behind these kinds of people and pair that with the fact that people have very little exposure to trans individuals I don't even know any, I don't personally know any trans people, right? It's very uncommon to personally know somebody who's trans. So it's, it's a bit complicated, these topics. And that's why it's, it's taboo. But that has to change, and it is changing. But the thing on the right that I think is very bad is the sense that people want to cloak this anti-trans rhetoric in this idea that they want to protect the children. It's all about the children. That's sneaky. That's uh, disingenuous to, to cloak all your anti-trans rhetoric and, and that hatred in this kind of, oh, oh, we want to protect the children. The children aren't being harmed because somebody's trans. That's nonsense. And I know some people are going to say, well, Mike, the people are forcing kids to go undergo these gender-affirming surgeries. That's not the case. There, there is no case in which children are forced to undergo this kind of, those kind of procedures. It doesn't exist. And the amount of children undergoing these surgeries are very small. Now, I'm not going to get into politics about this, whether I think we should do it or shouldn't. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the real science. So, again, let's all tie it back to the brain. That's where gender comes from. The root of gender and gender identity is the brain. So, Let's go back to the 1990s when people f had more access to fMRIs where they can take a look at the brain in a detailed way and they can pick out individual parts of the brain and see how they're activated when people think certain ways or when they respond to certain things. So in the 90s, a lot of transgender studies came out and exposed so many things about this issue. So to start, every human being begins as a single cell, and eventually in utero, they are exposed to hormones and all kinds of chemicals, and, and they develop in certain ways, driven by their genetics. We see that surges in hormones like testosterone when a human undergoes fetal development, it can drive their sexuality. For example, there's a very strong correlation between testosterone and being lesbian. Uh, lesbian women have more testosterone versus straight women. Now. The inverse cannot be said for gay men, necessarily. It's a bit more complicated, but hormones do drive fetal development and drive neural development. And scientists have found more and more recently that regions in the brain like the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex, the hypothalamus, the default mode network, these parts of the brain have a lot to do, and the, the amygdala as well. These parts of the brain have a lot to do with sexuality and gender. In fact, when we look at gay men's brains, we find that they have very similar hypothalamus cell structures and sizes as straight women. So straight women and gay men have correlated brain types in some ways. And the same could be said for the insula. There's a 2014 study that found a very strong correlation between insula and how the insula activates in the brain and gender identity. In terms of gray matter and white matter, there's also correlations there too. In trans women, we found that they have very similar activations in the gray matter as cisgender women. So cisgender women and trans women have very similar brains. 
Another 2010 study found that white matter is very correlative between a trans woman and cisgender woman. So, again, the, the, these, these correlations are adding up. A 2020 meta-analysis on the cerebral cortex found that there's a cortical thickness correlation between trans women and cisgender women as well. And all these regions of the brain I mentioned were all responsible for things like perception, self-perception, awareness, identity, um, emotional regulation. These are very intertwined with gender identity. Very, very intertwined also with sexuality. In the 1995 study, they found that there is a strong relation as well in the hypothalamus between trans women and cisgender women. Hypothalamus is responsible for things like hormone regulation, sexual behavior, sorry, these are very related to gender. And again, this is a very recent domain of research, uh, this area, right? Uh, it's hard to find uh, very good transgender uh, participants for these studies, because it's, it's rare to find, it, especially ones who haven't gone through HRT, because, for example, there is something called neuroplasticity in the brain, which any difference or changes in hormones can affect as well your, your brain structures and how you think. So that's why HRT works on transgender folks. But also remember that because of the complicated nature of the brain, we're never going to find a strictly male brain or a strictly female brain type. There's a spectrum of brains, but... Again, we find patterns consistently throughout transgender brains at the moment. There's lots more research to do, but as of now, we can find very distinct patterns between brains. But again, we know, as we do for gay and lesbian men and women, we know that there's a very strong connection between how the brain is activated in certain regions and sexuality and gender. There's a very, very distinct correlation here. And just like I'm a cisgender male, I, I identify as a man, my brain tells me how to behave sexually. My brain tells me how to think sexually. It tells me how I identify in society. The science is fairly clear on this issue. There's no magic happening. The, the transgender people are not devils. They're not satanic. It's just human nature. So I, I understand the, the, the panic when you see a transgender individual going into the restroom that you don't want them to go into or something, right? But just know that it's no different than me or you going to the bathroom uh, of our respective uh, genders because they're not doing this as some kind of facade or some kind of joke or some kind of game. This is how they really think. Just as me and you think this way, they think that way, and that's it. And to the people on the left, don't demonize every person who's gender critical. Just approach it with a scientific perspective. And I think that will help the conversations flow better. Look, in the 1970s, it was still considered a mental illness to be gay or lesbian. It was still considered a mental illness. Well, the paradigm shifted because we've learned more about this situation. Why? Not because we fought each other, but because we learned about the science together. The same will happen with transgender people. Uh, it will be the case within the next couple decades that the paradigm will shift yet again and people will be more accepting of this because it's just human nature. And look, no surprise, the more we learn about the brain and all of its trillions of synapses, we're going to find out how complicated we are. And that's it's an amazing thing to embrace, how complicated we are as people. It's great. So we can unite in the sense that all of us, transgender, cisgender, all of us should embrace our complexities and our intricacies of being human.